right, Ed, thanks for joining us for our uh, virtual Rotary meeting today. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> so um, you know how this goes. We're going to start. Um, tell us about what we what happened out at where we're going to be this weekend. Tell us about the, the I can do itself. that. First of all, I have to tell you, for the, for the newbies in the group, this started about 20 years ago with me playing grandfather at the fireside chat the week before 1812, telling the story of what happened out there. And I just, I'm not able to be there this year. At any rate, uh, put yourself in December of 1812. We have been at war with the British for about six months. War began with presidential action by James Madison in June of 1812. Uh, the British scored a series of victories in the West. Uh, Mackinac had fallen to the British. Dearborn, which is Chicago, had fallen to the British, and Detroit had fallen to the British. So there is urgency in the West, in this part of the country, to bringing relief to those three places, particularly Detroit. And the commander of the forces in the West is William Henry Harrison, later territorial governor of Indiana and later president of the United States. Harrison, who is down in what is now Cincinnati, is putting together a uh, outfit to come up along the, uh, the route, Western Ohio route, and relieve the attacks that are being waged by the Miami and Delaware Indians on um, the mil American military columns. The Indians are loosely associated with the British at this point. They're staging raiding parties coming from this part of the country, from the upper Wabash coming over to the Ohio line, and basically it's harassment of the American forces. So Harrison puts together a, a, a troop of 600 over in um, Columbus, Ohio, under the command of uh, Colonel Campbell, John B. Campbell, orders them to this part of the country, to the upper Wabash, to the valley of the Mississinawa, to wipe out or at least disrupt the uh, tactics being used by the Indians. They do. They, they head in this direction. They arrive here in what is now Pleasant Township of Grant County on the 17th of December. They set up camp at an Indian village which they have burned. They put their horses in a uh, uh, tether line. They camp for the night. Early in the morning, pre-dawn hours, the troop of Indians comes down the Mississinawa. They cross the river at uh, about what is now the memorial site for the Battle of Mississinawa that the Battlefield Society put in 30 years ago. They come up that swale and they attack uh, the troops in the early morning hours. That is the battle. Now there have been times when it was described as a major battle, a major uh, turning point in the war. It was not. In all fairness, it was a skirmish. Uh, there, there were casualties, certainly. There were a dozen American troops who died. There were about 50 Indians who died. We don't have an exact number there. Before the shooting stopped about dawn. Uh, it was serious enough that Colonel Campbell decided he could not go on. He res uh, gathered his force, what was left of it, and began the return trip to Ohio with some Indian prisoners that he had taken. Now, by the time the story of what happened here got to Ohio and then to Washington, it became a major victory for the American forces. It truly was not a major victory, it was not a major battle, it was a skirmish. But it's ours and it's the only one we have in the state of Indiana, so we have a certain amount of pride. Um, when it was all over with, indeed the Indian resistance had been broken, there were no more raids on uh, Harrison's troops, and the war was prosecuted from that point forward. 
and this part of the country was no longer a central player in it. Um, there are all sorts of interesting uh, sidebars to this. One of them is that eight troops who were buried or who were killed on that battlefield are buried out there. It's on private property, so there has never been a proper archaeological investigation done uh, to establish that that's where it was. We know where their camp was because there was a tree or a tether line there with about 400 horses and a lot of those horses were killed and we know from early journals in the late uh, 18th and 19th or early 19th century excuse me early 20th century that it was a kind of a weekend sport to go out there and dig horseshoes that they were all concentrated along that tether line so we know where we know where the battle was fought we know what happened there were good diaries kept good journals kept um, and it's well documented. Now let's let's come forward 150 years to why we are doing what we are doing this weekend. Back in 1986, a few of us got together one night and got overserved at Folkies and started talking about what had happened out there at the Mississinawa battlefield. So it, and it truly was out there. It was somewhere out there. Nobody knew really what had happened, knew it was in December. A fellow named Murray Holliday, who was a CPA and was, uh, I guess, the first employer of Bert Ewer and Kathy Moritz years ago, had written a um, small book, a pam more of a pamphlet than a book, on the battle. So there was some documentation. But we decided, those of us who had gathered that night, that we ought to do something to commemorate it not to celebrate it. And that's been central to this from the very beginning, that whatever we do out there is a commemoration of a multicultural collision. Uh, from day one, we have had Native Americans on the board of uh, directors of the Battlefield Society, all that, those kinds of things. So it was to be a commemoration, observance, of a War of 1812 battle fought in our neighborhood, in our county, in our t the Pleasant Township of Grand County. So we kind of dithered for a couple of years trying to figure out what might work. And because I had some influence at the newspaper at that point, I put an item in the newspaper saying that on the following Tuesday night, and this was in 1987, we were going to have a meeting at the Marion Public Library to discuss some sort of official um, observance of the War of 1812 battle on the Mississinawa. And we had about 30 people show up at that meeting. And that was the night that the Mississinawa Battlefield Society was formed. We elected officers. We started doing all the things like getting a charter for it and uh, 501c3 designation, all that kind of thing. And it took us about a year from that point forward to get the event ready to go. And we really didn't know what the event was going to be. We knew it was going to be a reenactment of some sort. We didn't, we, I'm talking about people like Martin Lake, uh, Joe Noble, uh, Jerry Olinger, there were, there were a bunch of us that were involved at that point. We didn't really know what we were going to do because we hadn't had any experience at this sort of thing. And the first year that we were out there, we did a limited reenactment. Um, we had a limited number of vendors, and it rained cats and dogs. On the su first Sunday morning of the first Mississippi 1812 and 89, we gathered around the tent at about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning and said, do we shut it down or do we keep going? We said, no, we keep it going. And that set a precedent that has been observed for the 30-odd years since then. Is this the 35th year or 34th? How are you counting? I, Thir I think 35th. Is the 35th? Okay. Uh, that has been observed consistently, and that is that weather does not stop Mississippi 1812. The only thing that did was COVID for a year. And um, we have abided by that since then. 
Uh, it is there, rain or shine, hot or cold, snow, sleet, all those kinds of things. We've been there in the snow. We have been there in 85 degree heat. Uh, and quite frankly, the snow is more fun than the heat. 85 degrees at Mississippi 1812 is not what you want because people are dressed for autumn weather, they want an autumn day, all those kinds of things. But the event uh, has grown. We cultivated it, we nurtured it, we did what we could to make it grow. But it also uh, was nurtured by simply interest in the event, interest in roots history. And we didn't know it at the time, but we were on the cusp of an interest in people finding their roots back in the late 80s, early 90s. And it grew and uh, it has reached the state that it is. One of the things that was added about halfway through back in the late 90s was the education day on Friday. And that has been terribly important to us. From the very beginning, our purpose was to be educational and we wanted young people involved. We wanted them out there. We wanted to teach them something of what had happened here, but what life was like on the frontier. So we created the Education Day on Friday, in which we invite schools throughout Indiana, and we have had them from all over the state through the years. I think the, I remember one year we had 109 school buses parked up in the lot. Uh, and hoping to God that there'd be no rain and that the kids would get out of there and we wouldn't have any kids left behind. My job always on Friday was to make sure there were no kids left over on Friday night. Uh, but the, the focus on Friday is education and young people and nurturing interest in history. And then uh, on Saturday and Sunday, we hope that the young people will bring their parents back uh, step back in history, take a step into a previous century, get a look at the event, get a look and, and maybe spark some interest in doing other things historical. So that's kind of how we got here. It's, it's why uh, the Mississippi 1812 reenactment occurs and it was all as a tribute to the War of 1812 action that took place here on the morning of December 18th of 1812. That's great. I think you covered it. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ed, and uh, we will see everybody out. Go out and have a good time and sell pork chops like crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Ed.